Chapter 19 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Outscheller. Chapter 19. It was not yet daylight when they approached the Texan camp. Despite the fact that the Texan force was merely a band of volunteer soldiers, there was an abundance of sentinels, and they were halted when they were within a half a mile of the Salado. But they were recognized quickly, and they passed within the lines where, in the first rosy shoot of the dawn, they saw Bowie going the rounds of the outpost. What? he exclaimed. Back already? Then did you not get into the town? We went right into it. We split it wide open, said the ring-tailed panther. Bowie's blue eyes glittered. But you are only three, he said. Where is Urea? We lost him, and we don't know how it happened. We know that he's gone, and that's all. Bowie took them into Mr. Austin's tent, where they told him, Houston, Fannin, and all the others that they had seen in San Antonio. In view of the fact, now clearly proved, that Coast was fortifying night and day, Bowie and all the more ardent spirits urged a prompt attack. But Mr. Austin, essentially a man of peace, hung back. He thought their force was too small. He was confirmed, too, in the belief of his own unfitness to be the leader in war. General, he said, turning to Houston, you must take command here. It would be impossible to find anyone better suited to the place. But Houston shook his head. He would not agree to it. Able and ambitious, he refused, nevertheless. Perhaps he did not yet understand the full fighting power of the Texans, and he feared to be identified with failure in case they made the assault upon San Antonio. When Ned and his comrades withdrew from the tent, they went to one of the breakfast fires, where they ate broiled strips of buffalo and deer, and drank coffee. Then Ned rolled in his blankets and slept under an oak tree. When he awoke about noon, he sprang to his feet with a cry of joy and surprise. Araya was standing beside him, somewhat pale, and with his left hand in a sling, but the young Mexican himself nevertheless. Ned seized his right hand and gave it a powerful grip. "'We thought you as good as dead, Don Francisco,' he said. We are sure that you had been taken by Kos. I thought of both things myself for a few wild moments, said Urea, smiling. When we rushed from the patio, one of the bullets grazed me, but in my excitement as we passed the gate, I ran down the alley toward the street, instead of turning in toward the barn, as I have since learned from Mr. White that you did. My wrist was grazed by one of the bullets, fired from the piazza, but fortunately I had the presence of mind to wrap it in the serape that I wore. When I reached the street, there was much excitement and many soldiers running about, but being a Mexican, it was easy for me to pass unsuspected in the crowd. I reached the home of a relative, I had heart a sympathizer with Texas in Liberty, where my wound was bound up and where I lay hidden until morning, when I was smuggled out of town. Then I made my way among the oaks and pecans, until I came here to our camp on the Salado. I had inquired for you during the night, and, not hearing any news of your capture, I was sure that you were hiding as I was, and when I came here, my best hopes were confirmed by the news of your complete escape. Mr. White has already given me all the details. We have been very lucky indeed, and we should be thankful. We are, we truly are, exclaimed Ned, grasping his hand again. The news brought by Ned and his comrades was so important that the Texans could not be restrained. A few mornings later, Bowie called upon the boy, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther for a new service. Mr. Austin has told me to take a strong party, he said, and scout up to the very suburbs of San Antonio, because we are to choose a new and closer position. There are to be ninety of us, including you three, Def Smith and Henry Carnes, and we are to retire if the Mexicans undertake an attack upon us. That is, if we have time, you understand, if we have time. Ned saw Bowie's big eyes glitter, and he understood. The party, the envy of all the others, rode out the camp in the absence of Araya. Bowie had not asked him, as he did not seem to fancy the young Mexican, but Ned put it down to racial prejudice. Urea had not been visible when they started, but Ned thought chagrin at being ignored was the cause of it. Fannin also went along, associated with Bowie and the leadership, but Bowie was the animating spirit. They rode directly towards San Antonio, and, as the distance was very short, they soon saw Mexican sentinels on horseback, some carrying lances and some with rifles or muskets. They would withdraw gradually at the appearance of the Texans, keeping just out of gunshot, but always watching these dangerous horsemen whom they had learned to fear. The Texans were near enough to see from some points the buildings of the town, and the veins of the ring-tailed panthers swelled with ambition. Ned, he said to the boy who rode by his side, if Bowie would only give the word, we would gallop right into town, smashing through the Mexicans. We might gallop into it, said Ned, laughing, but we couldn't gallop out again. No, no, panther, we mustn't forget that the Mexicans can't fight. 
Besides, Bowie isn't going to give the word. No, he ain't, said the ring-tailed panther with a sigh. And we won't get the chance to make one of the finest dashers ever heard of in war. He who doesn't dash but rides away will live to dash another day, said Obed White oracularly. They rode on in a half circle about the town, keeping a fairly close array, every man sitting his saddle erect and defiant. It seemed to Ned that they were issuing a challenge to the whole army of Kos, and he enjoyed it. It appealed to his youthful spirit of daring. They practically said to the Mexican army in the town, Come out and fight us if you dare. But the Mexicans did not accept the challenge. Save for the little scouting parties that always kept a watch at a safe distance, they remained within their entrenchments. But Bowie and Fannin were able to take a look at the fortifications, confirming in every respect all that Ned and his comrades had told them. They ate in the saddle at noon, having provided themselves with rations when they started, and then they rode back on their slow half-circle about the town, Mexican scouts riding parallel with them on the inner side of the circle, five hundred yards away. The Texans said little, but they watched all the time. It made a powerful appeal to Ned, who had been a great reader, and whose mind was surcharged with the old romances. It seemed to him that his comrades and he were like knights, riding around a hostile city and issuing a formal challenge to all who dared meet them. He was proud to be there in such company. The afternoon waned, banks of vapor, rose, and gold began to pile up in the southwest, their glow tinting the earth with the same colors. But beauty did not appeal just then to the ring-tailed panther, who began to roar. A riding and a riding, he said, and nothing done. Up to San Antonio and back to camp, and things are just as they were before. A Texas colonel rode out on the prairie with ninety men, and then rode back again, said Obed. But we are not going back again, cried Ned joyfully. Bowie, who was in the lead, suddenly turned his horse away from camp and rode toward the river. The others followed him without a word, but nearly every man in the company drew a long breath of satisfaction. Ned knew, and all knew, that they were not going back to camp that night. Ned eagerly watched the leader. They rode by the Mission Concepcion, passed through a belt of timber, and came abruptly to the river, where Bowie called a halt and sprang from his horse. Ned leaped down also, and he saw at once the merits of the position into which Bowie had led them. They were in a horseshoe or sharp bend of the river, here a hundred yards in width. The belt of the thick timber curved on one side while the river coiled in a half circle about them and in front of the little tongue of land on which they stood. The bank rose to a height of eighteen feet, almost perpendicular. It was a secluded place, and as no Mexicans had been following them in the course of the last hour, Ned believed that they might pass a peaceful night there. But the ring-tailed panther had other thoughts, although, for the present, he kept them to himself. They tethered the horses at the edge of the wood, but where they could reach the grass, and then Bowie placed numerous pickets in the wood through which an enemy must come, if he came. Ned was in the first watch, and Obed and the ring-tailed panther were with him. Ned stood among the trees at a point where he could also see the river, here a beautiful, clear stream with a greenish tint. He ate venison from his knapsack as he walked back and forth, and he watched the rays of the last sun, burning like red fire in the west, until they went out and the heavy twilight came trailing after it, the dark. Ned's impression of medievalism that he had received in the day when they were riding about San Antonio continued in the night. They had gone back centuries. Hidden here in the horseshoe, water on one side and wood on the other, they seemed to be an absolutely wild and primitive world. Centuries had rolled back. His vivid imagination made the forest about them what it had been before the white man came. The surface of the river was now dark. The stream flowed gently and without noise. It, too, struck upon the boy's imagination. It would be fitting for an Indian canoe to come stealing down in the darkness, and he almost fancied he could see it there. But no canoe came, and Ned walked back and forth in a little space, always watching the wood or the river. The night was very quiet. Their horses, having grazed an hour or two, now rested content. The men, not on guard, used to taking their sleep where they could find it, were already in slumber. There was no wind. The dark hours, as usual, were full of chill but Ned's vigorous walk back and forth kept him warm. He was joined after a while by the famous scout, Henry Carnes, who, like Deaf Smith, seemed to watch all the time, although he came and went as he pleased. Well, boy, said Carnes, do you find it hard work, this watching and watching and watching for hours and hours? Not at all, replied Ned, responding to the tone of humorous kindness. I might have found it so once, but I don't now. I'm always anxious to see what will happen. That's a good spirit to have, said Carnes, smiling. And you need it down here, where a man must always be watching for something. In Texas, boys have to be men now. He walked back and forth with Ned, and the lad felt flattered that so famous a scout should follow an interest in him. 
The two were at the edge of the wood where they could see duskily before them a stretch of bare prairie. Carnes was watching this open space intently, and Ned was watching it also. The boy saw nothing, but suddenly he heard, or thought he heard, a low sound. It was faint, but unconsciously bending forward a little, he heard it again. It was a metallic rattle, and instantly he called the attention of Carnes to it. The scout stopped his walk and listened. Then Ned saw his form grow rigid and tense. Let's put our ears to the ground, Ned, said he. The two stretched out ear to earth, and then Ned not only heard the noise much more distinctly, but he knew at once what it was. He had heard it more than once in the marching army of coasts. It was the sound made by the approaching wheel of a cannon. Artillery! he said in a whisper. Beyond a doubt, said Carnes. It means that the Mexicans have crossed the river. There's a four or two or three hundred yards above and mean to attack us. It was your good ear, Ned, that gave us the first warning. Ned flushed with pleasure at the compliment, but a moment or two later, they saw dark figures rising out of the prairie and advancing towards them. Mexicans! cried Carnes and instantly fired at a dusky outline. The figures flitted away in the dusk, but the camp of Bowie was aroused at once. Inside of a minute, every man was on his feet, rifle in hand, facing the open place in the horseshoe. They knew that they could not be attacked from the river. Bowie came to the side of Ned and Carnes. What is it? he asked. Ned heard a sound, Carnes replied, and when we put our ears to the earth, we knew that it was made by artillery. Then I saw their scouts and skirmishers and fired upon them. They must have crossed the river in a strong force, Colonel. Very likely, said Bowie. Well, we should be ready for them. Henry, you and Smith and the ring-tailed panther, scout across the prairie there and see what has become of them. Can't I go too? asked Ned. Bowie patted him on the shoulder. You young fire-eater, he replied. Haven't you done enough for one night? You gave us the first warning that the Mexicans were at hand. I think you'd better rest now and let these old boys do the job. The three chosen men disappeared in the darkness, and Ned sat down among the trees with Obed. They, like everybody else, waited as patiently as they could for the reports of the scouts. Obed, said Ned, do you think we're going to have a battle? The signs point that way. Bowie set everybody to work, cutting out undergrowth, in order that they might have a clear field for the work that they expected. By the time this task was completed, the scouts had returned and the report was alarming. The Mexicans had crossed the river in heavy force, outnumbering the troop of Texans at least five to one. They had artillery, infantry, and cavalry, and they were just out of range, expecting to attack at dawn. The avenue of escape was cut off already. Very good, said Bowie. We'll wait for him. It was too dark to see, but Ned knew that his blue eyes were glittering. He advanced to the point where the bluff rose nearly ten feet to the edge of the prairie and took a long look. I can see nothing, he said, but I know your men are right. Now we'll cut steps all along the edge of the bluff in order that our man can stand in them and fire at the enemy as he comes. Then we'll have as fine a fort as anybody could ask. The men fell to work with hatchets and big knives, cutting steps in the soft earth, at least a hundred of them in order that everybody might have a chance. Meanwhile, the hour of dawn was at hand, but only a heavy mist had thickened over prairie and river. Beyond the mists and vapors, the sun showed only a yellow blur, and it did not yet cast any glow over the earth. But Ned could clearly hear the Mexicans, officers shouting to men, men shouting to horses, Horses neighing and mules squealing, and he knew that from these noises that the report of the great force by the scouts was correct. He also heard the clank of the artillery wheels again, and he feared that the cannon would prove a very dangerous foe to them. All the pulses in his body began to beat fast and hard. "'Will the sun ever get through the fog and let us see?' he exclaimed impatiently. It was hard to wait at such a time. "'It's coming through now,' said the ring-tailed panther. The pale yellow light turned suddenly to full red gold, the banks of mist and vapor dissolved under the shining beams and floated away in shreds and patches. The river, the forest, and the prairie rose up in the light, and everything standing out sharp and clear. Ned drew a deep breath. There was the Mexican army, massed along the entire open space of the horseshoe, at least five to the Texan one, as the scouts had said, and now not more than two hundred yards from them. Five companies of cavalry were gathered ready to charge. Infantry stood just behind them, and back of the infantry, Ned caught a gleam of the cannon that he had heard in the night. Evidently, the Mexicans had not yet brought it to the front, because its fire would interfere with the charge of the cavalry, which they expected would end the battle in five minutes. There was no chance for the Texans to retreat, but it was not of retreat that they were thinking. "'How's your pulse, Ned?' asked the ring-tailed panther. "'It's beating fast and hard. I won't deny that,' replied Ned." but I believe my finger will be steady when it presses the trigger. Fine feathers make fine Mexicans, said Obed White. 
How they do love color. That's a gorgeous array out there, and it seems a pity to break it up. The Mexican force certainly looked well. The cavalry, in brilliant uniforms, presented a long front, their lances gleaming. The Texans, standing in the steps that they had cut in the earth, were in sober attire, but resolute eyes looked out from under the caps or wide brims of their hats. They'll charge in a moment, said Obed, and they'll try to break their way through the wood. They cannot ride down this bluff. The ring-tailed panther raised his rifle and looked down the sights. His eyes were glittering. He drew the trigger and the sharp, lashing report into the silence. A Mexican officer fell from his horse, and then, with a great shout, the Mexican horsemen charged, presenting a gallant array as they bent forward, their rifles and lances ready. The beat of the horse's hoofs came over the prairie like roiling thunder. They wheeled suddenly toward the wood, and then the infantry, advancing, opened heavy and repeated volley upon the Texans. The horsemen also fired from their saddles. It was the heaviest fire under which Ned had ever come, and, for a few moments, he quivered all over. He saw the great blaze in front, above it a cloud of lifting smoke, and he heard over his head the hum of many bullets, like the whistling of hail driven by a heavy wind. But he was experienced enough now to note that the Mexican fire was wasted. That bank was a wonderful protection. It's almost a shame to shoot him, roared the ring-tailed panther who had reloaded. But up went his rifle, his finger pressed the trigger, and another Mexican officer fell from his horse. All along the Texan front ran the rifle fire, a rapid crackling sound like the ripping apart of some great cloth. But the Texans were taking aim. There was no confusion among the hardy veterans of the plains. Lying against the face of the bluff, they were sending their bullets with deadly precision. Horse after horse and the charging host galloped away riderless over the prairie, and the front rank of the infantry was shot down. Ned, like the others, was reloading and firing swiftly, but with care. The imminent danger kept down any feeling that he would have had otherwise. The Mexicans sought their lives, and he must seek theirs. The smoke and the odor of burned gunpowder inflamed him. There was still a blaze in front of him, but he also saw the brown faces of the Mexicans yet pressing forward, and he heard the continued thunder of the charging hoofs. Another bullet, Ned, roared the ring-tailed panther, and he and the others around him sent a fresh volley at the horsemen. The Mexican cavalry could stand no more. Five companies strong, they broke and galloped away, seeking only to escape from the deadly fire of the Texan rifles. The infantry also gave back, and for a few moments there was a lull. That's the end of chapter one, said Obed White. Our Mexican friends came in haste, and they will repent at a distance. The smoke lifted, and Ned saw many fallen, both men and horses, on the plain in front of him, and there was confusion in the Mexican force, which was now out of gunshot. Never had the Texan rifles done more deadly service. The Texan loss was small. Ned dropped down from the steps and sat on the grass. His face was wet with perspiration, and he wiped it on his sleeve. He was compelled to cough once or twice to clear his throat of the smoke. The ring-tailed panther also was warm, but satisfied. A Texan does best in a fight against odds, he said, and we have the odds today. But don't you think, Ned, that it's over already? I don't, said Ned. I know that they will be up to some new trick soon. They realized that they underrated us at first. He sprang back into the steps that he had cut in the bluff and took a good look at the Mexicans. They are nearly ready with Chapter 2, Obed, he said. They are bringing up that cannon. They should have used it in the first place, said the ring-tailed panther. They didn't show much sense. The Mexicans were running the gun forward to a little mound, whence they could drop shells and shot over the edge of the bluff, directly among the Texans. It was a far more formidable danger than the impulsive charge, and Bowie at once took measures to meet it. He called the best rifle shots. Among them were Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther. There are fifteen of you, said the dauntless leader and your rifles will reach that gun. Shoot down every man who tries to handle it. The rest of us will attend to the new charge that is coming. The second attack was to be more formidable than the first. The Mexican cavalry had massed anew. Ned saw that the officers, driving the men into place with the flats of swords, had he heard the note of a trumpet singing loud and clear over the prairie. Then his eyes turned back to the gun, because there his duty lay. Ned heard the trumpet peal again, and then the thud of hooves. He saw the rammers and spongers gather about the gun. The rifle of the ring-tailed panther cracked, and the man with the rammer fell. Another picked it up, but he went down before the bullet of Obed. Then a sponger fell, and then the gunner himself was slain by the bullet. The Texans were doing wonderful sharpshooting. The gun could not be fired, because nobody could live near it long enough to fire it. Its entire complement was cleared away by the swift little bullets. Off to right and left, Ned heard again the rising crackle of rifle fire, and he also heard the steady monotonous beat of the hoofs. He knew that the charge was still coming on, but Bowie would attend to that. He and his immediate comrades never took their eyes from the gun. New cannoneers and entire complement were rushing forward to take the place of their fallen comrades. 
The Mexicans showed plenty of courage that day, but the deadly sharpshooters were slaying them as fast as they came. They were yet unable to fire the gun, nor could they draw it back from its dangerous position. A second time all about it were slain, and a third body came forward for the trial. "'Greasers or no greasers,' cried Obed, "'those are men of courage.' But he continued to shoot straight at them nevertheless, and the third group of cannoneers was fast melting away. "'Some of you aim at the mules hitched to the caisson,' cried the ring-tailed panther. "'I'd hate to kill a mule, but it'll be a help now.' One of the mules was slain, and the two others, wounded, dashed wildly through the Mexican infantry, adding to the confusion and turmoil. The last of the third group of cannoneers fell, and the gun stood alone and untouched, the shell still in place. No one now dared to approach it. The dead now lay in a group all about it. Meanwhile, the second charge broke like the first, and the cavalry galloped away wildly. Ned could turn his eyes now. He saw more riderless horses than before, while the fallen, lying still on the prairie, had doubled in number. Then his eyes turned back to the gun, standing somber and silent among those who had died for it. The battle fire gone for the present, Ned felt pity for the Mexicans who lay so thick about the cannon, nor did he fail to admire the courage that they had spent so freely, but in vain. They won't come again, said the ring-tailed panther, dropping to the grass. They've had enough. I don't blame them, said Obed, lying down by his side. They must have lost a third of their number, and they'd have lost another third if they had charged once more. They're not going away, said Ned, who had remained on his perch. They're coming again. A third time the Mexicans charged, and a third time they were driven back by the rifles. Then they formed on the prairie beyond gunshot and marched away to San Antonio, leaving behind the mournful and silent cannon as proof alike of their courage and defeat. End of chapter 19. Recording by Mr. Duck. Chapter 20 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 20. Ned watched the Mexicans marching away until the last lance had disappeared behind the swell of a prairie. Then he joined in the cheer that the Texans gave, after which he and his comrades went out upon the field and gazed upon their work. The killed among the Mexicans nearly equaled the number of the whole Texan force, sixteen lying dead around the cannon alone, and many of them also had been wounded, while the Texans had escaped with only a single man slain and but few hurt. But Ned had quickly left the field. The sight of it was not pleasant to him, although he was still heart and soul with the Texans in what he regarded as a defensive war. Bowie drew his forces out of the horseshoe, and they rode for the Texan camp, carrying with them the trophies of arms that they had taken. On their way, they met Mr. Austin and a strong force who had heard of their plight and who were now coming to their relief. They, too, rejoiced greatly at the victory, and all went back in triumph to the Salado. Now that they've seen a weakened fight, I reckon that Mr. Austin and Houston will order an attack right away on San Antonio, said the ring-tailed panther. I don't believe they will, said Obed White. Seeing is sometimes doubting. I believe that they still fear our failure. Ned inclined to Obed's belief, but he said nothing. At twilight, Urea came back, rejoicing and also full of regrets. He rejoiced over the victory, and he regretted that he had not been there. Seemed to me, Don Francisco, said the ring-tailed panther, that you're missing a lot of things. There's many a slip twixt Francisco and the Fito, said Obed. Ned was hurt by the irony of his friends, but Urea only laughed as he spread his blanket in a good place and lay down on it. I will admit, gentlemen, he said in his precise English, that I always seem to be absent when anything important happens, but it is owing to the nature of the service that I can rest under the Texans. Being of the Mexican race and knowing the country so thoroughly, I am of most value as a seeker of information. I had gone off on a long scout about San Antonio, and I have news which I have given to Mr. Austin. Spine's a dangerous business, but it's got to be done, said the ring-tailed panther. Ned saw that he again looked with disfavor upon Urea, but he ascribed it as before as to racial aversion. Obed was right. Despite the brilliant victory of Bowie, Houston, and Austin still held back, and the ring-tailed panther roared long and loud. But his roaring was cut short by an order for him, Obed, Ned, and Urea to ride eastward to some of the little Texan towns in search of help. The leaders were anxious that their utmost strength be gathered when they should at last make an attack upon San Antonio. Since he could not have just what he wished, the panther was glad to get the new task, and the others were content. They rode away the next morning, armed and provisioned well. Their horses, having rested long and fed abundantly, were fresh and strong.
and they went at a good pace until they came to the last swell from which they could see San Antonio. The town was distant, but it was magnified in the clear Texan sunlight. It looked to Ned, sitting there on his horse, like a large city. It had come to occupy a great place in his mind, and just now it was to him the most important town in the world. He wondered if they would ever take it. Araya, who was watching him, smiled. I know what you're thinking, he said, and I will wager that it was just the same that I was thinking. I was trying to read the future and tell whether we could take San Antonio, said Ned. Exactly. Those were my thoughts, too. I reckon you two wasn't far away from my trail either, said the ring-tailed panther, because I was figuring that we could take it inside of a month. Count me in, too, said Obed. Great minds go in bunches. I was calculating that we could capture it some day, but I left out the limit of time. They turned their horses, and then they reached the crest of the next swell. San Antonio was out of sight. Before them stretched the prairies, now almost as desolate as they had been when the Indians alone roamed over them. They passed two or three small cabins, each built in a cluster of trees near a spring, but the occupants have gone, fled to a town for shelter. One seemed to have been abandoned only an hour or two ago, as the ashes were scarcely cold on the hearth, and the bucket of water with its gourd in it still stood on the shelf. The sight moved the ring-tailed panther to sentiment. Think of the women and children having to sleep out on the prairie, he said. It ain't right and fitting. We'll bring them all back before we are through, said Obed. They left the little cabin exactly as they had found it, and then rode at an increased pace toward the north and the east, making for the settlements on the Brazos. A little while before nightfall, they met a buffalo hunter who told them that there were reports of a Mexican cavalry force far north in San Antonio. Although he could not confirm the truth of the rumors, Araya shook his head vigorously. Impossible! Impossible! he said. The Mexicans would not dare to come away so far from their base at San Antonio. The hunter, an old man, looked at him with curiosity and disapproval. That's more than you and me can say, he said. Although you be a Mexican yourself and know more about your people than I do, I just tell what I've heard. Mr. Array is one of the most ardent of the Texan patriots, said Ned. I just tell what I've heard, said the old man, whistling to his pony and riding away. Obstinate, said Araya, laughing in his usual light, easy manner. These old hunters are very narrow. You cannot make them believe that a Mexican, although born on Texas soil, which can be said of very few Texans, is a lover of liberty and willing to fight against aggression on the capital. At night they rode into a splendid belt of forest, and made their camp by a cool spring that gushed from a rock and flowed away among the trees. Ned and Obed scouted a little, and found the country so wild that the deer sprang up from the bushes. It was difficult to resist the temptation of a shot, but they were compelled to let them go, and returning to camp they reported to Urea and the ring-tailed panther that they seemed to have the forest to themselves, so far as human beings were concerned. Do you think it is safe to light a fire? asked Urea. I see no danger in it, replied Obed. That is, none in a little one. There are so many bushes about us that it couldn't be seen fifty yards away. It was now November, and as the night had come quite cold, Urea's suggestion of a fire seemed good to Ned. He showed much zeal in gathering the dry wood, and then they deftly built a fire, one that would throw out little flame, but which would yet furnish much heat. The ring-tailed panther, who had the most skill in wilderness life, kindled it with flint and steel, and while the flames, held down by brush, made hot coals beneath, the smoke was lost among the trees in the darkness. The horses were tethered near, and they warmed their food by the coals before eating it. The place was snug, a little cup set all around by bushes and high trees, and the heat of the fire was very grateful. While Ned sat before it, eating his food, he noticed great numbers of the last year's fallen leaves lying about, and he picked the very place where he could make his bed. He would draw great quantities of the leaves there under the big beech and spread his blankets upon them. They were tired after the long day's journey, and they did not talk much. The foliage about them was so thick, making it so dark within the little shade that need of the watch seemed small, but they decided to keep it nevertheless. The ring-tailed panther would take the first half of the night and Araya the second half. The next night would be divided between Obed and Ned. Ned raked up the leaves at the place that he had selected, folded himself between his blankets, and was asleep in five minutes. The last thing that he remembered seeing was the broad figure of the ring-tailed panther, sitting with his back against a tree and his rifle across his knees. But Ned awoke hours later, after midnight in fact, although it was not a real awakening, instead a sort of halfway station from slumberland. He did not move, but opened his eyes partly and saw that Araya was now on guard. The young Mexican was not sitting as the ring-tailed panther had been, but was standing some yards away with his rifle across his shoulder. Ned thought in a vague way that he looked trim and strong, and then his heavy lids dropped down again. 
but he did not fall back into the deep sleep from which he had come. The extra sense, his remarkable power of intuition or divination was at work, without any effort of his will or the mechanism of his brain, was moving and gave him a signal. He heard a slight noise and he lifted the heavy lids. Araya had walked to the other side of the little glade, his feet brushing some of the dry leaves as he went. There was nothing unusual in such action on the part of a sentinel, but something in Araya's attitude seemed to Ned to denote expectancy. His whole figure was drawn close together like that of one about to spring, and he leaned forward a little. Yet this meant nothing. Any good man on guard would be attentive to every sound of the forest, whether the light noise made by a squirrel as he scampered along the bark of a tree, or a stray puff of wind rustling the leaves. Ned made another effort of the will and closed his eyes for the second time, but the warning sense, the intuitive note out of the infinite, could not be denied. He was compelled to open his eyes once more, and now his faculties were clear. Araya had moved again, and now he was facing the sleepers. He regarded them attentively, one by one, and in the dusk he could not see that Ned's eyelids were not closed. The boy did not stir, but a cold shiver ran down his spine. He felt with all the power of second sight that something extraordinary was going to happen. Araya walked to the smoldering fire, and now Ned drooped his eyelids until he looked through only a space as narrow as the edge of a knife blade. Araya stooped and took from the dying heap a long stick, still burning at the end. Then he took another look at the three and suddenly disappeared among the bushes, carrying with him the burning stick. He was so light upon his feet that he made no sound as he went. Ned was startled beyond measure, but he was like a spring released by a key. He felt that the need of instant action was great, and as light of foot as Ure himself, he sprang up, rifle in hand, and followed the young Mexican. He was thankful for the wilderness training that he had been compelled to acquire. He caught sight of Ure about twenty yards ahead, still moving swiftly on soundless feet. He moved thus a hundred yards or more, with Ned as his shadow, and silent as dark as he, and then he stopped by the side of a great tree. Ned felt instinctively, when Urea halted, that he would look back to see if by chance he were followed, and he sank down in the bushes before the Mexican turned. Urea gave only a glance or two in that direction, and satisfied, began to examine the tree which was certainly worthy of attention, as it rose to an uncommon height, much above its fellows. Ned's amazement grew. Why should Araya be so particular about the size or height of a tree? It grew still further when he saw Araya lay his rifle down at the foot of the tree, spring up, grasp the lowest branch with one hand, and then deftly draw himself up, taking with him the burning stick. He paused a moment on the bough, looked again toward the little camp, and then climbed upward with a speed and dexterity worthy of a great monkey. Ned saw the Mexican figure going up and up, a dark blur against the stem of a tree, and it was hard to persuade himself that it was reality. He saw also the bright spark on the end of the stick that he carried with him. The tree rose to a height of nearly a hundred and fifty feet, and when Araya passed above the others that surrounded it, the moon's rays unobstructed fell upon him. Then, although he became smaller and smaller, Ned saw him more clearly. The boy was so much absorbed now in the story that was unfolding before him that he did not have time to wonder. Araya went up as high as the stem would sustain him. Then he rested his feet on a bough, wrapped his left arm around the tree, and with his right arm began to whirl the burning stick rapidly. The spark leaped up, grew into a blaze, and Ned saw the wheel of fire. He had seen many strange things, but this, influenced by circumstances of time and place, was the most uncanny of them all. Far above his head and above the body of the forest revolved the wheel of fire. Urea's own body had melted away in the darkness until it was fused with the tree. Ned now saw only the fiery signal, and for such it must be, and his heart rose with fierce anger against Araya. Once he lifted his rifle a little, and studied the possibilities of a shot at such range, but he put the rifle down again. He would watch and wait. The wheel ceased presently to revolve, and Ned saw Uraya again, torch in hand but motionless. He too was waiting. He did not stir for a full quarter of an hour, but all the time the torch burned steadily. Then he suddenly began to whirl it again, but in a direction opposite to that made by the first wheel of fire. Around and around went the burning brand for some minutes. Then he stopped. He waited at least ten minutes longer. Then, as if he had received the answer that he wished, making the claim of communication complete, he dropped the torch. Ned saw it falling, a trail of light, until it struck among the bushes, where it went out. Then Uraya began to descend the tree, but he came down more slowly than he had gone up. Ned slipped forward, seized Ureo's rifle, and then slipped back among the bushes. He put the Mexican's weapon at his feet, cocked his own, and waited. Ureo, coming slowly down the tree, stopped and stood there for a few moments as if in contemplation. 
A shaft of moonlight piercing through the foliage fell upon his face, illuminating the olive complexion and the well-cut features. It was hard for Ned to believe what he had seen. What could it be but a signal? And that signal to the enemies of the Texans. And yet Urea did not look like a villain and a traitor. There was certainly no malevolence in his face, which on the other hand had rather melancholy cast as he stood there on the bow before swinging to the ground. Ned strengthened his will. He had seen what he had seen. Such things could not be passed over in times when lives were the forfeit of weakness. Urea led himself lightly to the earth and stooped down for his rifle. It was not there, and when he straightened up again, Ned saw that his face was ghastly pale in the moonlight. Urea, with his quick perceptions, was bound to know from the absence of the rifle that he had been followed and was caught. His hand went down toward his belt where a pistol hung, but Ned instantly called from the bush, Hands up, Don Francisco, or I shoot. His tone was stern and menacing, and Araya's hands went up by the side of his head, but the paleness left his face and his manner became careless and easy. Is that you, Ned? He called in the most friendly tones. Is it a joke that you play upon me? Ah, you Anglo-Saxons, you seem rough in your play to us Latins. It's no joke, Don Francisco. I was never more earnest in my life, said Ned, stepping from the bush, but still keeping Araya covered with his rifle. Your merits as a climber of trees are great, but you interested me more with your wheel of fire. I think I can account now for your absences, when any fighting with the Mexicans was to be done. You are a spy, and you were signaling with that torch to our enemies. Araya laughed lightly, musically, and then he regarded Ned with a look of amusement. It seemed to say to him that he was only a boy, that one so young was bound to make mistakes, but that the Mexican was not offended because he was making one now at his cost. The laugh was irritating to the last degree, and yet it implanted in the boy's mind a doubt, a fear that he might have been mistaken. Signaling to friends, not enemies, you mean, said Araya. This forest ends but a few hundred yards beyond, and I learned that uh, when I was scouting about San Antonio, that some allies of ours in this region were waiting night and day for the news of us to come. I took this method to communicate with them, a successful method too, I am happy to say, as they answered. In a wild region, one must do strange things. His tone was so light, so easy, and it rang so true that Ned hesitated, but it was only for a moment. Manor could not change substance. He cleared away the mists and vapors made by Urea's light tone and easy assurance, and it came back to the core of the matter. Don Francisco, he said, I have liked you, and I believe that you are a true Texan patriot, but I cannot believe the story that you tell me. It seems too improbable. If you wished to make these signals to friends, why did you not tell us that you were going to do so? I did not know the possibility of such a signal until I saw this tree and its great height. Then, as all of you are asleep, I conducted to make my signal, to achieve the result and give you a pleasant surprise. Come now, Signor Edward, hand me my rifle and let us end this unpleasant joke. Ned shook his head, but it was hard to resist Urea's assurance. His manner was not at all. His logical mind rejected the story. I'm sorry, Don Francisco, he said, but I must refer this to my comrades, Mr. Palmer and Mr. White. Meanwhile, I am compelled to hold you a prisoner. You will walk before me to the camp, keeping your hands up. Araya shrugged his shoulders and gave Ned a glance, which seemed to be a mixture of disgust and contempt. Very well, if you will have it so, he said. There is nothing like the stubbornness of a boy. March, said Ned, who felt his temper rising. Araya, hands up, walked towards the camp, and Ned came behind him, carrying the two rifles, one of them cocked and ready for instant use. The Mexican never looked back, but walked with unhesitating steps straight to the camp. The ring-tailed panther and Obed were still sound asleep, but when Ned called sharply to them, they sprang to their feet, gazing in astonishment at the spectacle of Urea with his hands up and the boy standing behind him with the two rifles. Things seem to have happened while I slept, said Obed. Looks as if there might have been some ripping and tearing, said the ring-tailed panther. What have you been up to, Urea? Urea gave the ring-tailed panther a malignant glance. I have not been up to anything, to use your own common language, he replied. If you want any explanation, you can ask it of your suspicious young friend there. As for me, I am tired of holding my hands as high as my head, and I intend to light a cigarette. Three of you, I suppose, are sufficient to watch me. There were still a few embers, and touching his cigarette to one of them, he sat down, leaned against the trunk of a tree, and began to puff, as if the future of the case had no interest for him. Just hand me that pistol in your belt, will you? said Obed. There seems to be some kind of a difference of opinion between you and Ned and without knowing anything about it, I'm for Ned. Uraya took the pistol and tossed it toward Obed. The main man caught it deftly and thrust it in his own belt. He did not seem to be at all offended by the young Mexican's contemptuous manner. Besides being one of the best watchmakers in the state of Maine ever produced, he said, 
I'm pretty good at sleight of hand. I could catch loaded pistols all day, Araya, if you were to pitch them at me. Araya did not deign a reply, and Obed and the ring-tailed panther looked at Ned, who told them all he had seen. Araya did not deny a thing or say a word throughout the narrative. When Ned finished, the ring-tailed panther roared in his accustomed fashion. Signal unto the enemy from a treetop, or we are asleep and supposed to be on guard, he exclaimed. What have you got to say to this, Araya? Our young paragon of knowledge in wilderness lore has given you my statement, replied Araya. You can believe it or not as you choose. I shall not waste another word on thick heads. The teeth of the ring-tailed panther came together with a click, and he looked ominously at Uraya. You may not say anything, he growled, but I will. I didn't trust you at first, Don Francisco, and there have been times all along since then I didn't trust you. You're a smooth talker, but your habit of disappearing has been too much for me. I believe just as Ned does that you're signaling to the enemy and that you meant Texas harm, lots of harm. Who's lucky thing that the boy awoke? Now what do you think, Obed? Appearances are deceitful sometimes, but not always. Don Francisco seems to have spun a likely yarn to Ned, but as I've heard better, and they were not so mighty much. You see the jury is clean against you, Don Francisco, said the ring-tailed panther, and it's going to hold you to a higher court. Did you hear what I said? Araya nodded. Yes, I heard you, he replied, but I heard only foolishness. The ring-tailed panther growled, but he had the spirit of a gentleman, and he would not upbraid a prisoner. The verdict of the jury has been given, he said soberly. We've got to hold the prisoner till we reach the higher court. We ain't taking no chances, Uraya, and for that reason we've got to tie you. Ned cut off a piece of that lariat. Uraya leaped to his feet. He was stung at last. I will not be bound, he cried. Yes, you will, said the ring-tailed panther. I ain't going to hurt you, because I'm pretty handy at that sort of thing, but I'll tie you so you won't get loose in a hurry. Better sit down and take it easy. Urea, after the single flash of anger, sat down and, resuming his careless air, held out his hands. Since you intend to act like barbarians as well as fools, he said, I will not seek to impede you. None of the three replied. The ring-tailed panther handily tied his wrists together and then his ankles, but in such a fashion that he could sit still in comfort, leaning against the tree, although the pleasure of the cigarette was no longer for him. If you don't mind at all, he said, I think I shall go to sleep. No objections at all at all, said the ring-tailed panther. I have nice dreams. Araya closed his eyes, and his chest soon rose and fell in the regular manner of one who sleeps. Ned could not tell whether he really slept. A feeling of compassion for Araya rose again in his heart. What if he should be telling the truth after all? Wild and improbable tales sometimes came true. He was about to speak of the thoughts to the men, but he checked himself. Disbelief was returning. It was best to take every precaution. You go to sleep, Ned, said Obed. You've done a good job, and you are entitled to a rest. The panther and I will watch till day. Ned lay down between his blankets, and everything was so still that, contrary to his expectations, he fell asleep and did not awaken again until after dawn, when Obed told him that they would resume the march, eating their breakfast as they went. Uraya was unbound, although he was first searched carefully for concealed weapons. I wouldn't have a man to ride with his arms tied, said the ring-tailed panther. But we'll keep on both sides of you, and you needn't try to make a bolt of it, Araya. I shall not try to make any bolt of it, said Araya scornfully. But you will pay dearly to Austin and Houston for the indignity that you have put upon me. The ring-tailed panther, true to his principle of never taunting a prisoner, did not reply, and they mounted. The panther rode ahead, and Obed and Ned, with Araya between them, followed. Araya was silent, his face melancholy and reproachful. The belt of timber extended only a few hundred yards farther, when they came upon the open prairie extending to the horizon. Far to the left some antelope were feeding, but there was no other sign of life of any kind. I don't see anything of them friends of ours who you are signaling, said the ring-tailed panther. Uraya would not reply. The panther said nothing further, and they rode on over the prairie. But both the ring-tailed panther and Obed were watching the ground, and when they had gone about two miles, they reined in their horses. See? they exclaimed simultaneously. They had come to a broad trail cutting directly across their path. It was made by at least a hundred horses, and the various novice could not have missed it. The trail was that of shod hooves, indicating the presence of white man. What is this, Don Francisco? asked the ring-tailed panther. I do not have to reply unless I wish, said Araya, but I am willing to tell you that it is undoubtedly the trail of the Texan reinforcements to which I was signaling last night. Ned looked quickly at him. Again, the young Mexican's voice had the ring of truth. Was the wild and improbable tale now coming true? If so, he could never forgive himself for the manner in which he had treated Uraya. 
Still, it was for the older men to act now, and he continued in silence. Maybe Texans made this trail, and maybe they didn't, said Obed. But I think we'd better follow it for a while and see. How old would you say this trail is, Panther? Not more than two hours. They turned their course and followed the broad path left by the horsemen across the prairie. Thus, they rode at a good pace until nearly noon, and the trail was now so fresh that it could not be far away. The change of direction had brought them toward forest, heavy with undergrowth. It was evident that horsemen had gone into this forest as the trail continued to lead straight into it, and the ring-tailed panther approached with the greatest caution. "'Can you see anything, Ned, in there among them trees and bushes?' he asked. "'You've got the sharpest eyes of all.' "'Not a thing,' replied Ned. "'Nor do I see a bush or bow moving.' "'It would be hard for such a big party to hide themselves,' said Obed. "'So I think we'd better ride straight in.' They entered the forest, still following the trail among the trampled bushes riding slowly over rough ground and watching Wanley to right and left. Hooray had not said a word, but when they were about a mile within the wood, he suddenly leaned from his horse, snatched the knife from the belt of the ring-tailed panther and slashed at him. Fortunately, the range was somewhat long for such work, and as the panther threw up his arm, the blade merely cut his buckskin sleeve from wrist to elbow, only grazing his skin. Hooray, quick as lightning, turned his horse, threw him against that of Obed, which was staggered, and then started out a gallop among the trees. The ring-tailed panther raised his rifle, but Araya threw himself behind his horse, riding with all the dexterity of a Comanche in the fashion of an Indian who wishes to protect himself, that is, hanging on the far side of the horse by only hands and toes. The panther shifted his aim and shot the horse through the head, but Araya leaped clear of the falling body, avoided Obed's bullet, and darted into the thickest of the bushes. As he disappeared, a sharp, piercing whistle rose. Ned did not have time to think, but when he heard the whistle, instinct warned him that it was a signal. He had heard that whistle once before in exciting moments, and by a nervous action as it were, he pulled hard on the reins of his horse. In this emergency, it was the boy whose action was the wisest. Come back, Obed, you and Panther, he shouted. He may have led us into an ambush. Obed and the ring-tailed Panther were still galloping after Araya, and even as Ned shouted to them, a flash of flame burst from the undergrowth. He saw Obed's horse fall, but Obed himself sprang clear. The Panther did not seem to be hurt, but in an instant, both were surrounded by Mexicans. Obed was seized on the ground, and the panther was quickly dragged from his horse. But the main man, even at such a critical moment, did not forget the boy for whom he had such a strong affection. He shouted at the top of his voice, Ride, Ned! Ride for your life! Ned, still guided by impulse, wheeled his horse and galloped away. It was evident that his comrades had been taken, and he alone was left to carry out their mission. Shots were fired at him, and bullets whistled past, but none touched him, and he only urged his horse to greater speed. The boy felt a second impulse. It was to turn back and fall, or be taken with the two comrades whom he liked so well. But then the reason came. He could do more for them to free than a captive, and now he began to take full thought for himself. He bent far over on his horse's neck, in order to make as small a target as possible, holding the reins with one hand and his rifle in the other. A minute had taken him clear of the undergrowth, and once more he was on the prairie. Ned did not look back for some time. He heard several shots, but he judged by the reports that he was practically out of range. Now he began to feel sanguine. His horse was good and true, and he rode well. As long as the bullets could not reach and weaken, he felt that the chances were greatly in his favor. He was riding almost due north, and the prairie stretched away without limit, although the forest extended for a long distance on his right. He now straightened up somewhat in the saddle, but he did not yet look back, fearing that he might check his speed by doing so, and knowing that every moment was of the utmost value. But he listened attentively to the pursuing hoofs, and he was sure that the beat was steadily growing fainter. The gap must be widening. He glanced back for the first time and saw about twenty Mexicans spread out in the segment of a circle. They rode ponies, and two or three of them were recoiling lariats, which they had evidently got ready in the hope of a throw. Ned smiled to himself when he saw the lariats. Unless something happened to his horse, they could never come near enough for a cast. He measured the gap, and he believed that his rifle of long range would carry it. One of the Mexicans rode a little in front of the others, and Ned judged him to be the leader. Twisting in his saddle, he took aim at him. It is difficult to shoot backwards from a flying horse, but Ned had undergone the wilderness training, and he felt that he could make the hit. He pulled the trigger, the jet of smoke leaped forth, and the man, swaying, fell from the saddle, but sprang to his feet and clapped his hands to his shoulder, where the boy's bullet had struck. There was confusion among the Mexicans, as it was really their leader whom Ned had wounded, and, before the pursuit was resumed with energy, the fugitive had gained another hundred yards. After that, the gap widened steadily, and when he looked back a second time, the Mexicans were a full quarter of a mile in the rear. He maintained his speed, and in another hour they were lost behind the swells. 
Sure that he had made good his escape, Ned pulled his horse down to a walk. The good animal was dripping with foam and perspiration, and he did not allow him to cool too fast. Without his horse, he would be lost. But when they had gone another hour to walk, he stopped and let him have complete rest. Ned was not able to see anything of the Mexicans. The prairie, as far as he could tell, was bare of human life save himself. To his right was the dark line of the forest, but everywhere else the open extended to the horizon. He had escaped. They had started as four, and now but one was left. Urea had proved to be a traitor, and his good friends, Obed and the ring-tailed panther, were captured, or he refused to consider the alternative. They were alive. Two men so strong and vital as they could not have fallen. Now that his horse had rested, Ned mounted again and rode at a trot for the forest. He knew the direction in which the settlements lay, and he could go on with his mission. Men would say that he had shown great skill and presence of mind in escaping from the ambush, when those older and more experienced had been trapped. But when the alternatives were presented to Ned's mind, he had not hesitated. They were lingering before San Antonio, and the call for volunteers was not so urgent. He was going back to rescue his comrades or be taken or fall on the attempt. One of the great qualities of Ned's mind was gratitude. Had it not been for Obed, he might yet be under the sea in a dungeon in the castle of San Juan Giula. The ring-tailed panther had done him a hundred services, and would certainly risk his life, if need be, to save Ned's. He would never desert him. The forest was not so near as it looked on the prairie, but two hours' riding brought him to it. He knew that it was the same forest in which Obed and the panther had been taking, here extending for many miles. He believed that the Mexicans, being far north of their usual range, would remain in the forest, and he was glad of it. He could work much better under cover than on the prairie. This was undoubtedly the Mexican band of which the old hunter had spoken, and Araya had given his signal to it from the tree. Ned did not believe that it would remain long in this region, but would go swiftly south, probably to reinforce coasts in San Antonio. He must act with speed. It was several hours until night, and he rode southward through the forest, which consisted chiefly of oak, ash, maple, and sweet gum. There was not much undergrowth here, and he did not have any great fear of ambush. Turning in, yet farther to the right, he saw a fine creek, and he followed its course until the undergrowth began to grow thick again. Then he dismounted and fastened his horse at the end of his lariat. The boy had already come to his conclusion. The presence of the creek had decided him. He believed that the Mexicans, for the sake of water, had encamped somewhere along its course, and all he had to do was to follow its stream. He marked well the spot at which he was leaving his horse, and began what he believed to be the last stage of his journey. Ned was glad now that the undergrowth was dense. It concealed him well, and he had acquired skill enough to go through it swiftly and without noise. He advanced two or three miles when he saw a faint light ahead, and he was quite sure that it came from the Mexican camp. As he went nearer, he heard the sound of many voices, and when he came to the edge of a thicket, belief became certainty. The entire Mexican force was encamped in a semicircular glade next to the creek. The horses were tethered at the far side, and the men, eighty or a hundred in number, were lying or standing about several fires that burned brightly. It was a cold night, and the Mexicans were making themselves comfortable. They were justified in doing so, as they knew that there was no Texan force anywhere within a day's ride. They had put out no sentinels, quite sure that wandering Texans who might see them would quickly go the other way. Ned crept up as close as he dared, and, lying on his side in a dense thicket, watched them. Their fires were large and a bright moon was shining. The whole glade was filled with light. The Mexicans talked much, after their fashion, and there was much moving about from fire to fire. Presently the eyes of the boy, watching in the bush, lighted up with a gleam which was not exactly that of benevolence. Araya was passing before one of the fires. Ned saw him clearly now, the trim, well-knit figure, and the handsome, melancholy face, but he was no prisoner. Many of the Mexicans made way for him, and all showed him deference. Ned had liked Araya, but he could not understand how a man could play the spy and traitor in such a manner, and his heart flamed with bitterness against him. The Mexicans continued to shift about, and when two more men came into view, Ned's heart leaped. They were alive. Prisoners they were, but yet alive. He had believed that two so vivid and vital as they could not perish, and he was right. Obed and the ring-tailed panther sat with their backs against the same tree. They were unbound and the armed Mexicans were all about him, and they did not have a chance. They were thirty yards away, and Ned could see them very plainly, yet there was a wall between him and these trusty comrades of his. Obed and the panther remained motionless against the tree. Apparently they took no interest in the doings of the Mexicans. Ned, yet seeing no way in which he could help them, watched them for a long time. He saw Araya, after a while, come up and stand before them. The light was good enough for him to see that Araya's expression was sneering and triumphant. Again, Ned's heart swelled with rage. 
The traitor was exulting over the captives. Berea began to speak. Ned could not hear his words, but he knew by the movement of the man's lips that he was talking fast. Undoubtedly, he was taunting the prisoners with words as well as looks, but neither Obed nor the ring-tailed panther made any sign that he heard. They continued to lean carelessly against the tree, and Araya, his desire to give pain foiled for the time, went away. Now Ned bestirred his mind. Here were the Mexicans, and here were his friends. How should he separate them? He could think of nothing at present, and he drew back deeper into the forest. There, lying very close among the bushes, he pondered a long time. He might try to stampede the horses, but the attempt would be more than doubtful, and he gave up the idea. It was now growing late, and the fires in the Mexican camp were sinking. The wind began to blow, and the leaves rustled dryly over Ned's head. Best thoughts sometimes spring from little things, and it was the dry rustle of the leaves that gave Ned his idea. It was a desperate chance, but he must take it. The increasing strength of the wind increased his hope. It was blowing from him directly toward the camp. He retreated about a quarter of a mile. Then he hunted until he found where the fallen leaves lay thickest, and he raked them into a great heap. Drawing both the flint and steel, which he, like other borderers, always carried, he worked hard until the spark leaped forth and sent the leaves on fire. Then he stood back. The forest was dry like tinder. Ned had nothing to do but set the torch. In an instant, the leaves leaped into a roaring flame. The blaze ran higher, took hold of the trees, and ran from bough to bough. It sprang to other trees, and, in an incredibly brief space, a forest fire, driven by the wind, sending forth sparks in myriads and roaring and crackling, was racing down upon the Mexican camp. Ned kept it behind the fire and to one side. Sparks fell upon him, and the smoke was in his eyes and ears, but he thought little just then of such things. The fire, like many others of its kind, took but a narrow path. It was as if a flaming sword blade were slashed down across the woods. Ned saw it through the veil of smoke rush upon the Mexican camp. He saw the startled Mexicans running about, and he heard the shrill neigh of frightened horses. Never was a camp abandoned more quickly. The men sprang upon their horses and scattered in every direction through the woods. Two on horseback crowded Ned. They did not see him, nor did he pay any attention to them. But when a third man on foot came, running at the utmost speed, the boy seized him by the shoulder and was dragged from his feet. It is I, Obed, he cried. It is I, Ned Fulton. Obed White stopped abruptly, and the ring-tailed panther, unable to check himself, crashed into him. The three, men and boy, went to the ground, where they lay for a few moments among the bushes, half stunned. It was a fortunate chance as Araya, who had retained his presence of mind, was on horseback looking for their prisoners, and he passed so near that he would have seen them had they been standing. The three rose slowly to their feet, and the two men gazed in admiration at Ned. You did it, they exclaimed together. I did, replied Ned with pride, and it has worked beautifully. I was never so much in love with a forest fire before, said the ring-tailed panther. How it roars and tears and bites, and just let it roar and tear and bite. We'd better go on the back track, said Obed. The Mexicans are all running in other directions. My horse is back that way too, said Ned. Come on. They started back, running along the edge of the burned area. Before they had gone far, the ring-tailed panther caught a saddled and bridled horse which was galloping through the woods, and they were so much emboldened that they checked their flight and hunted about until they found a second. There must be at least thirty or forty of them dashing about through the woods, mad with fright, said Obed. Three are all we can use, including Ned's, said the ring-tailed panther, but I wish we had more weapons. They had found across the saddle of one of the horses a couple of pistols and holsters, but they had no other weapons except those that Ned carried. But they were free, and they had horses. The ring-tailed panther, customary growl between his teeth, became a chant of triumph. Did the Mexicans capture Obed and me? He said. They did. Did they keep us? They didn't. Why didn't they? There's a boy named Ned who escaped. He was a smart boy. A terribly smart boy. Did he run away and leave us? He didn't. There was only one trick in the world that he could work to save us, and he worked it. Oh, it was funny to see the Mexicans run with the fires scorching the backs of their ears. But that boy, Ned, ain't he smart? He whipped a hundred Mexicans all by himself. Ned blushed. Stop that, you panther, he said, or I'll call for Araya to come and take you back. Having horses, said Obed, there's no reason why we shouldn't ride. Here, jump up behind me, Ned. They were very soon back at the point where Ned had left his own horse and found him lying contentedly on his side. Then, well mounted each on his own horses, they resumed their broken journey. End of chapter 20. Recording by Mr. Duck. Chapter 21 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Outscheller. Chapter 21. Just after the three started, they looked back and saw a faint light over the trees, which they knew was caused by the forest fire still traveling northward. It seemed almost a sin to set the torch to the woods, said the boy, but I couldn't think of any other way to get you two loose from the Mexicans. It's a narrow fire, said the ring-tailed panther, and I guess it'll burn itself out against some curve of the creek a few miles farther on. This, in truth, was what happened, as they learned later, but for the present they could bestow the thought of only a few moments upon the subject. Despite the Mexican interruption, they intended to go on with their mission. With good horses beneath them, they expected to reach the Brazo settlements the next day unless some new danger intervened. They turned from the forest into the prairie and rode northward at a good gait. That was a fine scheme of yours, Ned, repeated the ring-tailed panther, and nobody could have done it better. You set the fire and here we are, together again. I was greatly helped by luck, said Ned modestly. Luck helps them that think hard and try hard. Didn't that fellow Urea give you that creeps? I had my doubts about him before, but I never believed he was quite as bad as he is. But Ned felt melancholy. It seemed to him that somebody whom he liked had died. I saw him talking to you and Obed, he said. What was he saying? The ring-tailed panther frowned, and Ned heard his teeth grit one upon another. He was saying a lot of things, he replied. He was talking low down, hitting at men who couldn't hit back, abusing prisoners, which was the same as Obed and me. He was doing what I guess you would call taunting, telling of all the things we would have to suffer. He said that they'd get you, too, before morning, and that we'd all be hanged as rebels and traitors to Mexico. He laughed at the way he fooled us. He said that spat he had with Sandoval was only make-believe. He said that we'd never get to San Antonio, that he kept coast informed about all our movements, and that Santa Ana was coming with a great army. He said that most of us would be chawed right up, and that them wasn't chawed up would wish they had been before Santa Anna got through with them. Many a threatened man who runs away lives to fight another day, said Obed cheerfully. That's so, said the ring-tailed panther. And I say it amongst us three, that if we don't take San Antonio, we'll have a mighty good try at it, and if it comes to hanging and all that sort of business, there's Texan as well as Mexican ropes. They reached another belt of forest about three o'clock in the morning, and they concluded to rest there and get some sleep. They felt no fear of the Mexicans who, they were sure, were now riding southward. They slept here four or five hours, and late the next afternoon reached the first settlement on the Brazos. Ned and his companions spent a week on the river, and when they rode south again, they took with them nearly a hundred volunteers for the attack on San Antonio, the last draft that the little settlements could furnish. Very few, save the women and children, were left behind. On their return journey, they passed through the very forest in which Ned had made his singular rescue of Obed and the ring-tailed panther. They saw the camp and they saw the swath made by the fire, a narrow belt, five or six miles in length, ending as the ring-tailed panther had predicted, at a curve of the creek. The Mexicans, as they now knew definitely, were gone days ago from that region. Perhaps we'll meet Araya when we attack San Antonio, said Ned. Maybe, said Obed. They rode to the camp on the Salado without interruption, and found that indecision still reigned there. The blockade of San Antonio was going on, and the men were eager for the assault, but the leaders were convinced that the force was too small and weak. They would not consent to what they considered a sure disaster. The recruits that the three brought were welcomed, but Ned noticed a state of depression in the camp. He found yet still there his old friends, Bowie, Smith, Carnes, and all the others. His news that Araya was a spy and traitor created a sensation. Ned was asked by Deaf Smith the morning after his arrival to go with him on a scout, and he promptly accepted. A rest of a single day was enough for him, and he was pining for new action. The two rode toward the town, then curved away to one side, keeping to the open prairie where they might see the approach of a superior enemy in time. They observed the Mexican sentinels at a distance, but the two forces had grown so used to each other that no hostile demonstration was made, unless one or the other came too close. Smith and Ned rode some distance, and then turned on another course, which brought them presently to a hill covered with ash and oak. They rode among the trees, and from that point of vantage searched the whole horizon. Ned caught the glint of something in the south, and called Smith's attention to it. What do you think it is? he asked after Smith had looked a long time. It's a sun shining on metal, either a lance head or a rifle barrel. Ah, now I see horsemen riding this way. And they are Mexicans, too, said Ned. What does it mean? A considerable force of mounted Mexicans was coming into view, and Smith's opinion was formed at once. It's reinforcements for Coase, he cried. 
We heard that Ugarchea was going to bring fresh troops from Laredo, and he would also have with him mule loads of silver to pay off Coast Man. We'll just cut off this force and take their silver. We'll ride to Bowie. They galloped at full speed to the camp and found the redoubtable Georgian, who instantly gathered together a hundred men, including the ring-tailed panther and Obed, and raced back. The Mexican horsemen were still in the valley, seeming to move slowly, but Bowie at once formed up the Texans for a charge. But before he could give the word, a trumpet pealed, and the Mexicans rode at full speed toward a great gully at the end of the valley into which they disappeared. The last that the Texans saw were some heavy-loaded mules following their master into the ravine. The ring-tailed panther burst into a laugh. Them's not reinforcements, he cried, and them's not mules loaded with silver. They're carrying nothing but grass. These men have been out here cutting feed in the meadow for coast horses. You're right, Panther, said Deaf Smith, somewhat crestfallen. But we'll attack just the same, said Bowie. Ah, oh, men need action. We'll follow them into that gully. On, men, on! A joyous shout was his reply, and the men galloped into the plain. They were about to charge for the gully when Bowie cried for them to halt. A new enemy had appeared. A heavy force of cavalry with two guns was coming from San Antonio to rescue the grass cutters. They rode forward with triumphant cheers, but the Texans did not flinch. They would face odds of at least three to one with calmness and confidence. Rifles ready, men, cried Bowie. They're about to charge. The trumpets pealed out the signal again, and the Mexicans charged at a gallop. Up went the Texans' rifles. A hundred fingers pressed a hundred triggers, and a hundred bullets crashed into the front of the Mexican line. Down went horses and men, and the Mexican columns stopped. But it opened in a few moments, and through the breach, the two cannon began to fire the heavy reports echoing over the plain. The Texans instinctively lengthened their line, making it as thin as possible, and continued their deadly rifle fire. Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther, as usual, kept close together, and Deaf Smith also was now with them. All of them were aiming as well as they could through the smoke, which was gathering fast, but the Mexicans, in greatly superior force, supported by the cannon, held their ground. The grass cutters in the gully also opened fire on the Texan flank, and for many minutes the battle swayed back and forth on the plain while the clouds of smoke grew thicker, at times almost hiding the combatants from one another. The Texans now began to press harder, and the Mexicans, despite their numbers and their cannon, yielded a little, but the fire from the men in the gully was stinging their flank. If they pushed forward much farther, they would be caught between the two forces and might be destroyed. It was an alarming puzzle, but at that moment a great shout rose behind them. The sound of the firing had been heard in the main Texan camp, and more Texans were coming by scores. It's all over now, said Obed. The Texans divided into two forces. One drove the main column of the Mexicans in confusion back upon the town, and the other, containing Ned and his friends, charged into the gully and put to flight or captured all who were hidden there. They also took the mules with their loads of grass, which they carried back to their own camp. Ned, the ring-tailed panther, Obed, and Deaf Smith rode back together to the Salado. It had been a fine victory, one as usual against odds, but they were not exultant. In the breast of every one of them had been a hope that the whole Texan army could seize the opportunity and charge at once upon Cos and San Antonio. Instead, they had been ordered back. They made their discontent vocal that, in the following evenings, there was no particular order among the Texans. They usually acted in groups, according to the localities from which they came, and some, believing that nothing could be done, had gone home disgusted. Mr. Austin himself had left, and Houston had persisted in his refusal to command. Burleson, a veteran Indian fighter, had finally been chosen for leadership. Houston soon left, and Bowie, believing that nothing would be done, followed him. It was only a few days after the grass fight, and despite that victory, Ned felt the current of depression. It seemed that their fortune was melting away without their ever putting it to the touch. Although new men had come, their force was diminishing in numbers, and San Antonio was farther from their hands as ever. We don't do something before long, said Henry Carnes. We'll just dissolve like a snow before a warm wind. And all our ripping and tearing will go for nothing, growled the ring-tailed panther. We've won every fight we've been in, and yet they won't let us go into that town and have it out with Kos. We'll get it yet, said Obed cheerfully. In war, it's a long lane that has no battle at the end. Just you be patient, panther. Patience will have her good fight. I've tested it more than once myself. Ned did not say anything. He had made himself a comfortable place, and as the cold night wind was whistling among the oaks and pecans, the fire certainly looked very good to him. He watched the flames leap and sink and the great beds of coals form, and once more he was very glad that he was not alone again on the Mexican mountains. He resolutely put off the feeling of depression. They might linger and hesitate now, but he did not doubt that the cause of Texas would triumph in the end. Ned was restless that night, so restless that he could not sleep, and, after a futile effort, he rose, folded up his blanket, and wandered about the camp. 
It was a body of volunteers drawn together by patriotism and necessity for a common purpose, and one could do almost as one pleased. There was a ring of sentinels, but everybody knew everybody else, and scouts, skirmishers, and foragers passed at will. Ned was fully armed, of course, and, leaving the camp, he entered an oak grove that lay between it and the city. As there was no underbrush here and little chance for ambush, he felt quite safe. Behind him he saw the camp and the lights of the scattered fires now dying, but before him he saw only the trunks of the trees and the dusky horizon beyond. Ned had no definite object in view, but he thought vaguely of scouting along the river. One could never know too much about the opposing force, an experience added to natural gifts that had given him great capabilities. He advanced deeper into the pecan grove, and reached the point where the trees grew thickest. There, where the moonlight fell, he saw a shadow lying along the ground, the shadow of a man. Ned sprang behind a tree and lay almost flat. The shadow had moved, and yet he could still see ahead. He felt sure that its owner was behind another tree and not yet ten feet distance. Perhaps some Mexican scout like himself. On the other hand, it might be Smith or Carnes, and he called softly. No answer came to his call. Some freak of the moonlight still kept its shadowy head in view, while its owner remained completely hidden, unconscious, perhaps, that any part of his reflection was showing. Ned did not know what to do. After waiting a long time and seeing that the shadow did not move, he edged his way partly around the trunk and stopped where he was still protected by the ground and the tree. He saw the shadowy head shift to the same extent that he had moved, but he heard no sound. He called again and more loudly. He said, I'm a Texan. If you are a friend, say so. No one would mistake his voice for that of a Mexican. No reply came from behind the tree. Ned was annoyed. This was the most puzzling, and he did not like puzzles. Moreover, his situation was dangerous. If he left the tree, the man behind the other one, and he did not doubt now that he was an enemy, could probably take a shot at him. He tried every maneuver he knew to draw the shot, and while he yet lay in ambush, but none succeeded. His wary enemy knew every ruse. Had it not been for the shadowy head, yet visible in the moonlight, Ned might have concluded that he had gone, but he had now been behind the tree a full half hour, and during all that time he had not heard a single sound from his foe. The singular situation, so unusual in its aspect and so real in its danger, began to set upon his nerves. He thought at last of something which he believed would draw the fire of the ambushed Mexican. He carried a pistol as well as a rifle, and carefully laying the cocked rifle by his side, he drew the smaller weapon. Then he crept about the tree, purposely making a little noise. He saw the shadowy head move, and he knew that his enemy was seeking a shot. He heard for the first time a slight sound, and he could tell from it exactly where the man lay. Raising his pistol, he fired, and the bark flew from the right side of the tree. A man instantly sprang out, rifle in hand, and rushed toward him, expecting to take him unarmed. Like a flash, Ned seized his own cocked rifle and covered the man. When he looked down the sights, he saw that it was Araya. Araya halted, taken by surprise. His own rifle was not leveled, and Ned held his life at his gun muzzle. Stop, Don Francisco, or I fire, said the boy. I did not dream that it was you, and I am sorry that I was wrong. Array recovered very quickly from his surprise. He did not seek to raise his rifle, knowing that it was too late. Well, he said, why don't you fire? I don't know, replied Ned. I would do it in your place. I know it, but there is a difference between us, and I am glad of that difference, egotistical as it may sound. There is another difference which perhaps you do not have in mind. You are a Texan, an American, and I am a Mexican. That is why I came among you and claimed to be one of you. You are fools to think that I, Francisco Araya, could ever fight for Texas against Mexico. It seems that we were, said Ned. Araya laughed somewhat scornfully. There are some Mexicans born here in Texas who are so foolish, he said. But they do not know Mexico. They do not know the greatness of our nation, nor the greatness of Santa Ana. What are your paltry numbers against us? You will fail here in San Antonio, and even if you should take the town, Santa Anna will come with a great army and destroy you. And then, remember that there is a price to be paid. Much rope will be used to good purpose in Texas. You have eaten our bread, and you have received kindness from us, and yet you talk of executions. I ate your bread, because it was my business to do so. I am not ashamed of anything that I have done. I do not exaggerate when I say that I have rendered my nation great service against the Texan rebels. It was I who brought them against you more than once. I should not boast of it. I should never pretend to belong to one side in war and work for another. Again, there is a difference between us. Now, what do you purpose to do? I am, as it were, your prisoner, and it is for you to make a beginning. Ned was embarrassed. He was young and he could not enforce all the rigors of war. He knew that if he took Uraya into the camp, the man would be executed as a spy and traitor. The Mexicans had already committed many outrages, and the Texans were in no forgiving mood. Ned could not forget that this man had broken bread with his comrades and himself, and once he had liked him. 
Even now his manner, which contained no fear nor cringing, appealed to him. Go, he said at last. I cannot take your life, nor can I carry you to those who would take it. Doubtless I am doing wrong, but I do not know what else to do. Do you mean that you let me go free? I do. You cannot be a spy among us again, and as an open enemy you are only as one among thousands. Of course you came here tonight to spy upon us, and it was an odd chance that brought us together. Take the direction of San Antonio, but don't look back. I warn you that I shall keep you covered with my rifle. Araya turned without another word and walked away. Ned watched him for a full hundred yards. He noticed that the man's figure was as trim and erect as ever. Apparently he was as wanting in remorse as he was in fear. When Araya had gone a hundred yards, Ned turned and went swiftly back to the camp. He said nothing about the incident to either Obed or the ring-tailed panther. The next day, Araya was crowded from his mind by exciting news. A sentinel had hailed at dawn three worn and unkempt Texans who had escaped from San Antonio, where they had long been held prisoners by coast. They brought word that the Mexican army was disheartened. The heavy reinforcements promised by Santa Ana had not come. A great clamor for an immediate attack arose. The citizen army gathered in hundreds about the tent of Burleson, the leader, and demanded that they be led against San Antonio. Fannin and Milam were there, and they seconded the demands of the men. Ned stood on the outskirts of the town, the ring-tailed panther on one side of him, uttering a succession of growls, but Obed on the other was silent. It looks like a go this time, said Ned. I think it is, said Obed, and if it isn't a go now, it won't be one at all. Waiting wears out the best of men. The ring-tailed panther continued to growl. A great shout suddenly arose. The panther ceased to growl and his face beamed. Burleson had consented to the demand of the men. It was quickly arranged that they should attack San Antonio in the morning and risk everything on the cast. The short day, it was winter now, was spent in preparation. Ned and his comrades cleaned their rifles and pistols and provided themselves with double stores of ammunition. Ned did not seek to conceal from himself, nor did the men seek to hide from him the greatness and danger of their attempt. They outnumber us and they hold a fortified town, said Obed, but whatever we do, we three must stick together. In union, there is often safety. We stick as long as we stand, said the ring-tailed panther. If one falls, the other two must go on, and if two fall, the last must go on as long as he can. Agreed, said Ned and Obed. They were ready long before night, but after dark, an alarming story spread through the little army. Part of it at least proved to be true. One of the scouts, sent out after the decision to attack had been taken, had failed to come in. It was believed that he had deserted to the Mexicans with news of the intended Texan advance. The leaders had counted upon surprise as a necessary factor in their success, and without it they could not advance. Gloom settled over the army, but it was not a silent gloom. These men spoke their disappointment in words many and loud. Never had the ring-tailed panther roared longer without taking breath. The Texans were still talking angrily about the fires when another shout arose. The mixing scout came in and he brought with him a Mexican deserter, who confirmed all the reports about the discouragement of the garrison. Once more, the Texans crowded about Burleson's tent and demanded that the attack be made upon San Antonio. At last, Burleson exclaimed, Well, if you can get volunteers to attack, go and attack. Milam turned, faced the crowd, and raised his hand. There was a sudden hush save for the deep breathing of many men. Then, in a loud, clear voice, Milam spoke in only ten words. They were, Who will go with old Ben Milam to San Antonio? And a hundred voices roared a single word in reply. It was, I! That settles it, said the ring-tailed panther with deep satisfaction. Old Satan himself couldn't stop the attack now. The word was given that the volunteers for the direct attack, 300 in number, would gather at the old mill halfway between the camp and the town. Thence they would march on foot for the assault. Ned and his comrades were among the first to gather at the mill, and he waited as calmly as he could. While the whole force was assembled, 300 lean, brown men, large of bone and long of limb. No light was allowed, and the night was cold. The figures of the men looked like phantoms in the dusk. Ned stood with his friends while Milam gave the directions. They were to be divided into two forces. One under Milam was to enter the town by a street called Asequia, and the other under Colonel Johnson was to penetrate by Soledad Street. They relied upon the neglect of the Mexicans to get so far before the battle began. Burleson, with the remainder of his men, would attack the ancient mission, and then turned into a fort called the Alamo. Deaf Smith, who knew the town thoroughly, led Johnson's column, and Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther were just behind him. Ned was quivering in every nerve with excitement and suspense, but he let no one see it. He moved forward with steady step, and he heard behind him the soft tread of the men who intended to get into San Antonio without being seen. He looked back at them. They came in the dusk like so many shadows, and no one spoke. 
It was like a procession of ghosts moving into a sleeping town. The chill wind cut across their faces, but no one at that moment took notice of cold. High over Ned's head, a great star danced and twinkled, and it seemed to him that it was the Texan star springing out. The houses of the town rose out of the darkness. Ned saw off to right and left fresh earthworks and rifle pits, but either no men were stationed there or they slept. The figure of Smith led steadily on, and behind him came the long and silent file. How much farther would they go without being seen or heard? It seemed amazing to Ned that they had come so far already. They were actually at the edge of the town. Now they were in it, going up the narrow Soledad Street between the low houses directly toward the main plaza, which was fortified by barricades and artillery. A faint glimmer of dawn was just beginning to appear in the east. A dusky figure suddenly appeared in the street in front of them and gave a shout of alarm. Deaf Smith fired and the man fell. A bugle pealed from the plaza and a cannon was fired down the street, the ball whistling over the heads of the Texans. In an instant, the garrison of Coast was awake, and the alarm sounded from every point of San Antonio. Lights flashed, arms rattled, and the men called to one another. Into this house, cried Deaf Smith. We cannot charge up a narrow street in the face of cannon. They were now within a hundred yards of the plaza, but they saw that the guide was right. They dashed into the house, solid and large, that he had indicated, and Ned did not notice that until he was inside that it was the very house of the vice governor of Aramendi, into which he had come once before. Just as the last of the Texans sprang through the doors, another cannonball whistled down the street, this time low enough. Milam's division, meanwhile, had rushed into the house of De La Garcia, nearby. As Ned and the others sprang forward to cover, he trampled upon the flowers in the patio, and he saw a little fountain playing. Then he knew. It was the house of Veramendi, and he thought that it was a singular chance that had brought him into the same place. But he had little time for reflection. The column of Texans, a hundred and fifty in number, were taking possession of every part of the building, the occupants of which had filed through the rear doors. To the roof, cried Deaf Smith. We can best meet the attack from there. The doors and windows were already manned, but Smith and many of the best men rushed to the flat roof and looked over the low stone coping. It was not yet day and they could not see well. Despite the lack of light, the Mexicans opened a great fire of cannon and small arms. The whole town resounded with the roar and the crash and also with the shouting, but most of the cannonballs and bullets flew wide and the rest spent themselves in vain on the two houses. The Texans, meanwhile, held their fire and waited for day. Ned, Smith, and the others on the roof lay down behind the low coping. They had achieved their long wish. They were in San Antonio, but what would happen to them there? Ned peeped over the coping. He saw many flashes down the street toward the plaza, and he heard the singing of bullets. His finger was on the trigger, and the temptation to reply was great, but like the others, he waited. The faint light in the east deepened, and the sun flashed out. The full dawn was at hand, and the two forces, Texans and Mexicans, faced each other. End of chapter 21. Recording by Mr. Duck. Chapter 22 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 22. The December sun, clear and cold, bathed the whole town in light. Houses, whether of stone, adobe, or wood, were tinted a while with gold, but everywhere in the streets and over the roofs floated white puffs of smoke from the firing, which had never ceased on any part of the Mexicans. The crash of rifles and muskets was incessant, and every minute or two came the heavy boom of a cannon in which coast swept the streets. The Texans themselves now pulled the trigger but little, calmly waiting their opportunity. Ned and his comrades still lay on the roof of the Veramendi house. The boy's heart beat fast, but the scene was wild and thrilling to the last degree. He felt a great surge of pride that he should have a share in so great an event. From the other side of the river came the rattle of rifle fire, and he knew that it was the detachment from Burleson attacking the Alamo. But presently the sounds there died. They are drawing off, said Obed, and it is right. It is their duty to help us here, but I don't see how they can ever get into San Antonio. I wish the Mexicans didn't have those cannon, which are so much heavier than ours. The Texans had brought with them a 12-pounder and a 6-pounder, but the 12-pounder had already been dismounted by an overpowering Mexican fire, and without protection, they were unable to use the 6-pounder, which they had drawn into the patio where it stood silent. Ned from his corner could see the mouths of the guns in the heavy Mexican battery at the far end of the plaza, and he watched the flashes of flame as they were fired one by one. In the intervals, he saw a lithe, strong figure appear on the breastwork, and he was quite sure that it was Urea. 
An hour of daylight passed. From the house of De La Garcia, the other division of Texans began to fire, the sharp lashing of the rifles sounding clearly amid the duller crash of musketry and cannon from the Mexicans. The Texans in the lower part of the Veramendi house were also at work with their rifles. Every man was a sharpshooter, and whenever a Mexican came from behind a barricade, he was picked off. But the Mexicans had also taken possession of houses, and they were firing with muskets from windows and loopholes. We must shoot down the cannoneers, shouted the ring-tailed panther to Deaf Smith. Smith nodded. Every man on the roof were fifteen in number, and now they devoted their whole attention to the battery. Despite the drifting smoke, they hit gunner after gunner. The fever in Ned's blood grew. Everything was red before him. His temples throbbed like fire. The spirit of the battle had taken full hold of him, and he fired whenever he caught a glimpse of a Mexican. Deaf Smith was on Ned's right, and he picked off a gunner. But to do so, he had lifted his head and shoulders above the coping. A figure rose up behind the Mexican barricade and fired in return. Deaf Smith uttered a little cry and clapped his hand to his shoulder. Never mind, he said in reply to the anxious looks. It's in the fleshy pot only, and I'm not badly hurt. The bullet had gone nearly through the shoulder and was just under the skin on the other side. The ring-tailed panther cut it out with his bowie knife and bound up the wound tightly with strips from his hunting shirt. But Ned, although it was only a fleeting glimpse, had recognized the marksman. It was Araya who had sent the bullet through Deaf Smith's shoulder. He was proving himself a formidable foe. But the men on the roof continued their deadly sharpshooting, and now the battery, probably at Araya's suggestion, began to turn its attention to them. Ned was seized suddenly by Obed and pulled flat. There was a roaring and hissing sound over his head as a 12-pound cannonball passed, and Ned said to Obed, I thank you. The cannon shot was followed by a storm of bullets, and then by more cannon shots. The Mexicans' guns were served well that day. The coping was shot away, and the Texans were in imminent danger from the flying pieces. They were glad when the last of it was gone, but they did not yet dare to raise themselves high enough for a shot. Balls, shell, and bullets swept the roof without ceasing. Ned lay on his side, almost flat. He listened to the ugly hissing and screaming over his head until it came unbearable. He turned over on his other side and looked at Smith, their leader. Smith was pale and weak from his wound, but he smiled wanly. You don't speak, but your face asks your question, Ned, he said. I hate to say it, but we can't hold this roof. I never knew the Mexicans to shoot so well before, and their numbers and cannon give them a great advantage. Below, lads, as soon as you can. They crept down the stairway and found that the house itself was suffering from the Mexican cannon. Holes had been smashed in the walls, but here the Texans were always replying with their rifles. They also heard the steady fire in the house of De La Garcia, and they knew that their comrades were standing fast. Ned, exhausted by the great tension, sat down on a willow sofa. His hands were trembling and his face was wet with perspiration. The ring-tailed panther sat down beside him. Good plan to rest a little, Ned, he said. We've come right into a hornet's nest and the hornets are stinging us hard. Listen to that, will ya? A cannonball smashed through the wall, passed through the room in which they were sitting, and dropped spent in another room beyond. Obed joined them on the sofa. A cannonball never strikes in the same place twice, misquoted Obed. So it's safer here than it is anywhere else in this Veramendi house. I'd help with the rifles, but there's no room for me at the windows and loopholes just now. Our men are giving it back to them, said Ned. Listen how the rifles crackle. The battle was increasing in heat. The Mexicans, despite their artillery and their heavy barricades, were losing heavily at the hands of the sharpshooters. The Texans, sheltered in their buildings, were suffering little, but their position was growing more dangerous every minute. They were inside the town, but the force of Burleson outside was unable to come to their aid. Meanwhile, they must fight five to one, but they addressed themselves with unflinching hearts to the task. Even in the moment of imminent peril, they did not think of retreat, but clung to their original purpose of taking San Antonio. Ned, tense and restless, was unable to remain more than a few minutes on the sofa. He wandered into another room and saw a large table spread with food. Bread and meat were in the dishes, and there were pots of coffee. All was now cold. Evidently, they had been making ready for early breakfast in the very Mende house when the Texans came. Ned called to his friends. Why shouldn't we use it, he said, even if it is cold. Why shouldn't we, said Obed. Even though we fight, we must live. They took the food and coffee, cold as it was, to the men, and they ate and drank eagerly. Then they searched everywhere and found large supplies of provisions in the house, so much, in fact, that the ring-tailed panther growled very pleasantly between his teeth. There's enough here, he said. The last two or three days, and it's well when you're in a fort ready to stand a siege to have something to eat. Some of the men now left the windows and loopholes to get a rest, and Ned found a place at one of them. Peeping out, he saw the bare street, torn by shot and shell. He saw the flash of the Texan rifles from the De La Garcia house, and he heard the blaze of the Mexican cannon in the plaza. 
Mexican men, women, and children on the flat roofs out of range were eagerly watching the battle. Clouds of smoke drifted over the city. While Ned was at the window, a second cannonball smashed through the wall of the Veramendi house and caused the debris to fall in masses. The colonel grew uneasy. The cannon gave the Mexicans an immense advantage, and they were now using it to the utmost. The house would be battered down over the heads of the Texans, and they could not live in the streets, which the Mexicans, from their dominating position, could sweep with cannon and a thousand rifles and muskets. A third ball crashed through the wall and demolished the willow sofa on which the three had been sitting. Plaster rained down upon the Texans. They looked at one another. They could not stay in the house, nor could they go out. A boy suddenly solved the difficulty. Let's dig a trench across the street to the De La Garcia house, cried Ned, and join our comrades there. That's the thing, they shouted. They had not neglected to bring entrenching tools with them, and they found spades and shovels about the house. But in order to secure the greatest protection for their work, they decided to wait until night, confident that they could hold their present position throughout the day. It was many hours until the darkness and the fire rose and fell at intervals. More shattered plaster fell upon them, but they were still holding the wreck of a house. When the welcome twilight deepened and darkened into the night, then they began to work just inside the doorway, cutting fast through plaster and adobe, and soon reaching the street. They made the trench fairly wide, intending to get their six-pounder across also. Just behind those who worked with spade and shovel came the riflemen. A third of the way across, the Mexicans discovered what was going on. Once more, a storm of cannon, rifle, and musket balls swept the street, but the Texans, bent down in their trench, toiled on, throwing the dirt above their heads and out on either side. The riflemen behind them, sheltered by the earth, replied to the Mexican fire and, despite the darkness, picked off many men. Ned was just behind Obed, and the ring-tailed panther was following him. All three were acting as riflemen. Obed was seeking a glimpse of Araya, but he did not get it. Ned was watching for a shot at the gunners. Once the Mexicans, under the cover of their artillery, undertook to charge down the street, but the sharpshooters in the trench quickly drove them back. Thus they burrowed like a great mole all the way across Soledad Street and joined their comrades in the strong hearts of De La Garcia. They also succeeded in getting both of their cannon into the house, and now united, the Texans were encouraged greatly. Ned found all the rooms filled with men. A party broke through the joint wall and entered the next house, thus taking them nearer to the plaza and the Mexican fortifications. All through the night, intermittent firing went on. The Mexicans increased their fortifications, preparing for a desperate combat on the morrow. They threw up new earthworks, and they loopholed many of the houses that they held. Kos, his dark face, darker with rage and fury, went among them, urging them to renewed efforts, telling them that they were bound to take prisoners, all the Texans whom they did not slay in battle, and that they should hang every prisoner. Great numbers of the women and children had hidden in the Alamo on the other side of the river. San Antonio itself was stripped for battle, and the hatred between Texan and Mexican, so unlike in temperament, flamed into new heat. Ned was worn to the bone. His lips were burnt in his feverish breath. The smoke stung his eyes and nostrils, and his limbs ached. He felt that he must rest or die, and seeing two men sound asleep on the floor in one of the rooms, he flung himself down beside them. He slept in a few minutes, and Obed and the ring-tailed panther, seeing him there, did not disturb him. If any boy has been through more than he has, said Obed, I haven't heard of him. And I guess that he and all of us have got a lot more coming, said the ring-tailed panther grimly. Ghost ain't going to give up here without the terriblest struggle of his life. He can't afford to do it. I reckon you're right, said Obed. Ned awoke the next morning with a taste of gunpowder in his mouth, but the Texans, besides finding food in the houses, had brought some with them, and he ate an ample breakfast. Then ensued a day that he found long and monotonous. Neither side made any decided movement. There was occasional firing, but they rested chiefly on their arms. In the course of the second night, the Mexicans opened another trench, from which they began to fire at dawn but the Texan rifles quickly put them to flight. The Texans now began to grow restless. Cooped up in two houses, they were in the way of one another, and they demanded freedom in action. Henry Carnes suggested that they break into another house closer to the plaza. Milam consented, and Carnes, followed closely by Ned, Obed, the ring-tailed panther, and thirty others, dashed out, smashed in the door of the house, and were inside before the astonished Mexicans could open an accurate fire upon them. Here they at once secured themselves, and their bullets began to rake the plaza. The Mexicans were forced to throw up more and higher entrenchments. Again, the combat became intermittent. There were bursts of rifle fire and occasional shots from the cannon, and now and then short periods of almost complete silence. Night came on, and Ned, watching from the window, saw Colonel Milam, their leader, pass down the trench and entered the courtyard of the Veramendi house. He stood there a moment, looking at the Mexican position. A musket cracked, and the Texan, throwing up his arms, fell. 
He was dead by the time he touched the ground. The ball had struck him in the center of the forehead. Ned uttered a cry of grief, and it was taken up by all the Texans who had seen their leader fall. A half-dozen men rushed forward and dragged away his body, but that night they buried it in the patio. His death only incited them to new efforts. As soon as his burial was finished, they rushed another house in their slow advance, one belonging to Antonio Navarro, a solid structure only one block from the Great Plaza. They also stormed and carried a redoubt, which the Mexicans had erected in the street beside the house. And now being midnight, they concluded to rest until the morrow. Meanwhile, they had elected Johnson their leader. Ned was in the new attack, and with Obed and the ring-tailed panther, he was in the Navarro house. It was the fourth that he had occupied since the attack on San Antonio. He felt less excitement than on the night before. It seemed to him that he was becoming hardened to everything. He looked at his comrades and laughed. They were no longer the semblance of white men. Their faces were so blackened with smoke, dirt, and burned gunpowder that they might have passed for Negroes. You needn't laugh, Ned, said Obed. You're just as black as we are. This thing of changing your boarding house every night by violence and the use of firearms doesn't lead to neatness. If fine feathers make fine birds, then we three are about the poorest flock that ever flew. But when we go for a house, we always get it, said the ring-tailed panther. You notice that. This place belongs to Antonio Navarro. I've met him in San Antonio and I don't like him, but I'm willing to take his roof and bed. Ned took the roof, but not the bed. He could not sleep that night, and it was found a little later that none would have had a chance to sleep. The Mexicans, advancing over the other houses, the walls of all which joined, cut loopholes in the roof of the Navarro house and opened fire upon the Texans below. The Texans, with sure aim, cleared the Mexicans away from the loopholes, then climbed to the roof and drove them off entirely. But no one dared to sleep after this attack, and Ned watched all through the dark hours. Certainly they were having action enough now, and he was wondering what the fourth day would bring forth. From an upper window, he watched the chilly sun creep over the horizon once more, and the dawn brought with it the usual stray rifle and musket shots. Both Texan and Mexican sharpshooters were watching at every loophole, and whenever they saw a head, they fired at it. But this was only the beginning, the crackling prelude to the event that was to come. "'Come down, Ned,' said Obed, "'and get your breakfast. We've got coffee and warm corn cakes, and we all need them, as we're already tired of this boarding house, and we intend to find another.' Can't stay more than one night in a place while we're in San Antonio, said the ring-tailed panther, growling pleasantly. A restless lot we are, and it's time to move on again. Ned ate and drank in silence. His nerves were quite steady, but he had become so used to battle that he awaited whatever they were going to attempt, almost without curiosity. Ain't you wanting to know what we're going to do, Ned? asked the ring-tailed panther. I'm thinking that I'll find out pretty quick, replied Ned. Now this boy is surely making a fine soldier, said the panther to Obed. He don't ask nothing about what he's going to do. He just eats and waits orders. Ned smiled and ate another corn cake. Maybe, said Obed. We'll meet our friend Urea in the attack we're going to make. If so, I'll take a shot at him, and I won't have any remorse about it either, if I hit him. They did not wait long. A strong body of the Texans gathered on the lower floor, many carrying, in addition to their weapons, heavy iron crowbars. The doors were suddenly thrown open, and they rushed out into the cool morning air making for a series of stone houses called the Zambrano Row, the farthest of which opened upon the main plaza, where the Mexicans were fortified so strongly. Scattering shots from muskets and rifles greeted them, but as usual, when any sudden movement occurred, the Mexicans fired wildly, and the Texans broke into the first of the houses before they could take good aim. Ned was one of the last inside. He had lingered with the others to repel any rush that the Mexicans might make. He was watching the Mexican barricade, and he saw heads rise above it. One rose higher than the rest, and he recognized Urea. The Mexican saw Ned also, and the eyes of the two met. Urea's were full of anger and malice, and raising his rifle, he fired straight at the boy. Ned felt the bullet graze his cheek, and instantly he fired in reply. But Urea had quickly dropped down behind the barricade, and the bullet missed. Then Ned rushed into the house. The boy was blazing with indignation. He had spared Urea's life, and yet the Mexican had sought at the first opportunity to kill him. He could not understand a soul of such caliber but the incident passed from his mind for the time being in the strenuous work that they now began to do. They broke through partition wall after wall with their powerful picks and crowbars. Stones fell about them, plaster and dust rained down, but the men relieving one another, the work with the heavy tools, was never stopped until they penetrated the interior of the last house in the row. Then the Texans uttered a grim cry of exultation. They looked from the narrow windows directly over the main plaza, and their rifles covered the Mexican barricades. 
The Mexicans tried to drive them out of the houses with the guns, but the solid stone walls resisted balls and shells, and the Texans' rifles shot down the gunners. Then ensued another silence, broken by distant firing, caused by another attack upon the Texan camp outside the town. It was driven off quickly, and the Texans in the houses lay quiet until evening. Then they heard a great shouting, the occasion of which they did not know until later. Ugarchea with 600 men had arrived from the Rio Grande to help Coase, but it would not have made any difference with the Texans had they known. They were determined to take San Antonio, and all the time they were pressing harder on Coase. That night, the Texans, Ned with them, seized another large building called the Priest's House, which looked directly over the plaza, and now their command of the Mexican situation was complete. Nothing could live in the square under their fire, and in the night, Ned saw the Mexicans withdrawing, leaving their cannon behind. Exhaustion compelled the boy to sleep from midnight until day, when he was aroused by Obed. The Mexicans have all gone across the river to the Alamo, said the main man. San Antonio is ours. Ned went forth with his comrades. Obed had told the truth. The great seat of the Mexican power in the north was theirs. Three hundred daring men, not strongly supported by those whom they had left behind, had penetrated to the very heart of the city through house after house, and had driven out the defenders who were five to their one. The plaza and the Soledad Street presented a somber aspect. The Mexican dead, abandoned by their comrades, lay everywhere. The Texan rifles had done deadly work. The city itself was silent and deserted. Most of the population has gone with the Mexican army to the Alamo, said Obed. I suppose we'll have to attack that, too. But Kos, the haughty and vindictive general, did not have the heart for a new battle with the Texans. He sent a white flag to Burleson and surrendered. Ned was present when the flag came, and the leader of the little party that brought it was Urea. The young Mexican had lost none of his assurance. You have won now, he said to Ned, but bear in mind that we will come again. You have yet to hear from Mexico and Santa Ana. When Santa Ana comes, he will find us here ready to meet him, replied Ned. The Texans, in the hour of their great and marvelous victory, behaved with humanity and moderation. Coase and his army, which still doubled in numbers, both the Texans, who had been inside and outside San Antonio, were permitted to retire on parole beyond the Rio Grande. They left in the hands of the Texans 21 cannon and great quantities of ammunition. Rarely has such a victory been won by so small a force, and in reality, with the rifle alone. All the Texans felt that it was a splendid culmination to a perilous campaign. Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther, seated on their horses, watched the captured army of Coase march away. Well, Texas is free, said the ring-tailed panther. And San Antonio is ours, said Obed. But Santa Anna will come, said Ned, remembering the words of Araya. End of the Texan Star. Recording by Mr. Duck.